Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucy Jones. Thank you and, and good evening. Uh, sorry about the bit of a delay. Those endearing children grow up, become students at UC Irvine, and I unfortunately listened when I got to, it's cool, Mom, it's only five minutes, and uh, it wasn't. So, <laughs> but the bit of a delay, I'll get started here. Um, what I want to talk to you tonight about is the great Southern California shakeout and how science has been applied to trying to reduce risks from earthquakes here in Southern California. I don't know how many of you have heard about the shakeout so far. It's being planned for November 13th, the week of November 13th, and it's going to be a week of special activities to inspire Southern Californians to get ready for big earthquakes, and it will include the largest earthquake drill ever attempted in the United States. All the drill itself is on November 13th. We are asking groups that will participate to register on our website, and those that have registered so far, we already have three and a half million participants, and we've still got seven weeks to go before the, the drill itself. I think we're going going to be, well, I, I expect to double that number. Um, why are we doing this and how are we doing this? One of the things we know about earthquake readiness in Southern California is that whatever it is we're doing to teach people to take action to make themselves safer in earthquakes isn't working. We have a lower level of preparedness now than we did in 1971. A smaller percentage of people, for instance, are storing water, extra water. So we know that what, how we've been communicating it hasn't been working. And what we're trying to do through the shakeout is to take a different approach and, and engage the community in a real discussion about what the earthquake issue is. Because we can go listen to the, the sociologists have actually studied this. They do a pretty good job of figuring out what gets people to do things. Uh, it's a little less common that hard scientists actually listen to what those soft scientists have to say. Uh, but in this instance, we have been communicating very well. And there's some very clear-cut things that get people to take action. The first thing you need to do is you need to give them good information over and over and over again. I mean, for, we've, got to, we've got to market uh, earthquake preparedness like we do Coca-Cola. Uh, I mean, how old were you the first time you saw, you saw a Coke commercial? Anyone want to say? Five, okay? And when was the last time you saw a Coke commercial? Yesterday. How many do you think you've seen in between? Okay. Coca-Cola knows to get you to take action, you need to get the message over and over and over again and never stop giving the message. So that's one thing we know we've got to do if we want to get people to understand earthquakes is we need to make sure there's clear information easily available. Another thing we know about getting people to, uh, to take action is what was uh, de uh, in, well, determined by sociologists over 100 years ago and given the name of monkey see, monkey do. People will copy what they see other people doing. So if you see somebody drinking Coke every day, you're more likely to try one yourself. We need to get people seeing other people taking actions about earthquakes. We've discovered most people don't believe there's, that their actions make a difference. The earthquakes are inevitable. Don't we just have to live with them? And the idea that, in fact, you're making a choice every day that's going to be determining what your life is like after the earthquake is not something that most people are, be, are aware of. We just don't think about it. And so seeing people taking positive action is going to be a really important part. And then the last thing they tell us that's really important is a process called milling. Because people don't like to do what other people tell them to do. They like to think it's their own idea. And we need to go through a process where people believe the earthquake problem is their own problem and their own actions are going to make a difference and it's their idea to do it, to get people to actually take action. So what we're trying to do is to get people seeing people taking action about earthquake safety, having a lot of information about what you can do to be safe and get people talking about it. So those are the goals behind the shakeout. And it's why we're trying to get everybody doing the drill on one day. To be able to do this, we need to talk about what's an earthquake like. And that's one of the other things we've discovered. We say you need to prepare for a big earthquake, but if you don't know what that means, what is it that you're supposed to be doing? And so we undertook a process to create a scenario of a big earthquake. 
And we needed to start with one that was very plausible, something that we should be ready for. And science has given us a very obvious answer about this one. This is a result of a major study done by another group with, within the U.S. Geological Survey and the California Geological Survey, looking at everything we know about the rate of earthquakes in California, and, and in fact in the whole United States, and came up with this map, which shows the probability that a point in California will be involved in a, mag a large earthquake, at least magnitude 6.7. I'll get back to that and say why we say involved rather than an epicenter. But the main point to notice is look at that number one, the southern San Andreas Fault. The cumulative probability of having a, a very large earthquake on that part of the fault is now almost 60% at least for the next 30 years. That's about 2% chance per year for this part, the southernmost part of the San Andreas. That is an incredibly likely earthquake. It's about as high as we ever see. Uh, I'll give you a little, I'll also be showing you why that's true in the future, in the, later on in this talk as well. But this is an earthquake that's so likely, every Southern Californian should be, every Californian should be prepared for this event. So if we're going to be prepared, we need to figure out what it is that it's going to be like. And what we did was engage a large group of people over a wide variety of disciplines. We had earth scientists to tell us what the earth was going to do, how would the fault move, what would the shaking be. We then had engineers uh, involved with us to tell us what the physical damage would be. Given what the earth was doing, how does that affect the built environment? And then we engaged the social scientists. Given that this happens to us, what will happen to our society? And we were trying to understand, first, what a big earthquake's really like, so that if you're preparing, you're preparing for the right thing. We were then also looking at the idea of what's the difference between a disaster and a catastrophe. You know, we, we've been through Northridge. We know that we did okay with that. What's the chance that we're going to end up with something like Katrina, where even now, three years later, the city of New Orleans has less than half the number of people that it had before the, the hurricane hit. And then what I really consider the most important question, what could we do now that would change the answer to those questions? Mm -hmm. To pull this together, we involved a large number of uh, scientists with us. We had an original development team that sort of kept everybody on track. Our jobs was to to talk to every one of the scientists on a regular basis and make sure they stayed in the, in the collaboration and kept on working together. We also got to do all the writing. We then had the section leaders, and as I said, we covered a wide range of, of expertise from earth science through engineering, public health, sociology, and uh, economics. And all told, we had over 300 people that were involved in this study, and we accomplished it in just, under a, uh, just over a year, six weeks beyond my, my one-year deadline that I gave them, which is pretty good in science. Uh, I can <laughs> uh, all of this information is available for download. Uh, you can get it all. There, there are uh, PDF versions either of the full report if you're into reading 300 pages of scientific documentation. There's also a public version that's a lot easier to get through. Let me, I want, I'm going to explain now what are some of the results of this study, how we, how we got through it, and, and what we came to the conclusion of. But I want to start with one point to make sure we're all on the same page here. I've discovered that after 70 years of Caltech telling Southern California that earthquakes happen at epicenters, a lot of people think it's true, uh, and it's not, okay? An earthquake begins at an epicenter, or actually technically at the hypocenter, which is the point on the Earth's surface, or per point on the fault, where epicenter is the point on the Earth's surface above the hypocenter, but it happens over a surface. Actually, a good analogy for an earthquake is snapping your fingers. When you snap your fingers, you take two surfaces and you put them in frictional contact. Because of the friction, it doesn't move sideways. If you're trying to push sideways, it won't move. If you didn't push together a lot, if you had no friction, you'd slide past, the, the fingers would slide past each other, not making a noise. If there was no friction on the fault, the two sides of the fault would move without producing an earthquake. And there are places in the world where that happens, where we have what we call a creeping fault. But as long as you have friction, it resists the sideways motion until the, the uh, stress finally overcomes the friction, slips suddenly, and releases energy in the form of a sound wave. And what I'm doing here is I'm making the air vibrate, and the wave is traveling out into your ears and making the, the air inside your ear vibrate. Same thing goes on in the earth. We slip on the fault, which creates sound and shear waves that travel through the rock and cause the ground under your house to vibrate. 
But notice, you can't, you can't snap your fingers at a point. If you had only an epicenter, if you only had a point there, you wouldn't be able to make any sound. You have to have a surface. And not only do you have to have a surface, but every point on that surface releases energy, which means that the bigger the fault is, the bigger the earthquake. So it's, that's, and that is what determines the size of an earthquake. It's the area of the fault that moves during the event. If we look at some data from Southern California earthquakes over the last century, where we're showing magnitude on the bottom and the length of the fault that actually moved in the earthquake on the vertical scale, and you notice that it's a logarithmic scale in kilometers, so that a magnitude five and a half is a few kilometers across. The Chino Hills earthquake that just happened, the 5.4, it was about four kilometers or not quite three miles across. To get the big earthquakes, 1906 at magnitude 7.8, the great San Francisco earthquake, was 440 kilometers long, okay? Over 250 miles. And you just can't get a really big earthquake on anything less than hundreds of kilometers of fault. So when we want to look at what's going to happen with our biggest earthquakes, we need to go and look for our longest faults, and that is the San Andreas Fault. Right? The San Andreas Fault is the longest fault in California. It's about 1,200 kilometers long. Uh, the one piece of good news is that we do have a creeping section. I just said that there's places where we don't build up stress to big earthquakes. This middle part of the San Andreas Fault has little earthquakes and moves in, in creep events, slow slip without any energy being, uh, at least no, no shaking energy released when they move. And we don't think that there will ever be a big earthquake through that section. The 1906 earthquake, which is a 7.8, is up here, filled the whole northern part of the San Andreas Fault. The San Andreas ends at Cape Mendocino. In 1857, we had a very comparable earthquake, probably about magnitude 7.9, as we estimate from the geologic record. But as you go farther south, we have to go farther back in time. There's a little earthquake in 1812 that we know broke trees in Wrightwood. The trees that grow in the fault zone were actually disrupted by the earthquake. So we were able to pinpoint with tree rings that that earthquake went through there. But it wasn't very big and didn't take up a very large section of the fault. If you go farther south, we go back to 1680 before we have the last earthquake. Right? So we see a, a wide range down the fault. In the north, it's been 100 years since the last earthquake, 150 here, and down to 300 years since the last earthquake here. Well, how does that compare with how often we'd expect to have them otherwise? We need to turn to a form of geology that's called paleoseismology. Paleoseismology are geologists who don't want to just be alone off in the mountains by themselves. They actually call, climb into a hole in the ground to be alone to do their work, the ultimate and introverts. Uh, and this would be an example of how it works. This is a trench across the San Andreas Fault in the Coachella Valley. It's been cut into the fault. This one actually was done by developers because there's a state law that when you build near the San Andreas or any of the major faults, you can't build your building across it. We don't want the, the houses to literally be ruptured in half by the earthquake. So we, you need to find out where the fault is for certain and build away from it. And then some of the developers have been very publicly spirited and have given us uh, permission and, and leave the trenches open for us to go in and do work. What we do is we go and find evidence of the earthquake. For instance, right here's the fault along the red um, flags here. And what we're looking for is something like here where we can see that there's a bed that's been disrupted by this fault. And then maybe up here there's a bed that, that lays flat over on top of it. We know that the earthquake and earthquake had to have happened between the time the sediment that was broken was deposited and the sediment that wasn't broken. And so we can bracket the times of the earthquakes. And what we can do then is then get a history. And we've done this in many sections of the fault. I've got an example here from the Coachella Valley where we have each of these shows the time of previous earthquakes at some place along the southern section. And what we see is that we average, between 800 and 1700 AD, we had six earthquakes we averaged about 150 years between events. And in fact, every other place on the San Andreas Fault, it's either, it's 100 to 150 years, the average time between earthquakes. Except that it's been 300 years since the last one down here in the Coachella Valley. And that's the fundamental data that we're working from. We average 100 to 150 years between events. It's been 300 since the last one. 
At some point, our luck's got to run out. Now, we do know that whatever causes long intervals is happening right now. And when your average is 100 years and it's been 300, or it's average is 100 years and it's been 350, that isn't, you know, we could easily go another 50 years. But we're not going to go forever. And when it does happen, there's an awful lot of energy stored up along that part of the fault, much more than is usually there. So this is the earthquake we decided we really need to to worry about and is the one we decided to use as part of this um, uh, scenario. Now, how do we go about doing this? We actually have to design an earthquake. We talked about our earthquake design team. Right? There's several steps that the earth scientists need to take to decide what the earthquake's going to be. The San Andreas could move any part of this, but we had to decide, we had to specify which section we thought would move and how much we thought it would move. And that was specified from the geologic record to be like previous events. From that, we would go to seismology to actually make calculations about what the shaking from the fault should be. Then we'd need to turn that into the type of parameters that the engineers use to decide how the building behaves. And then we took a fourth step of looking at the secondary sort of effects that could happen. Earthquakes are notorious for triggering landslides, liquefaction, fault rupture. There's a lot of direct geologic uh, impact that happens beyond the shaking. So all of those went into the design process. So our first step was we had to specify, and this is, this is the, the biggest assumption we made. Based on what our geologists understand about the fault, this is what we consider a plausible earthquake. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, so we, what we had to specify is what the length of fault was, and we took it from the very southern end of the San Andreas up to Lake Hughes, which is a place where in the 1857 earthquake, the amount of slip changed dramatically. So farther north, there was more slip released in 1857, and, you know, we could have let it extend farther. Um, very plausible earthquake as well. We didn't actually because we would have had to go to an even bigger supercomputer to make the calculations, and this way we could get it done in the year that we had to do the work. Um, so don't think that this is the worst it can be. We also just we philosophically decided we didn't want to do the worst-case scenario. We don't want you to be able to dismiss these results as being the worst case and why am I going to live to see this. This is a really plausible earthquake that you're going to be seeing. Then we had to specify how much it slipped. Oh, and that's what the height of this red fence is showing you. And you see we have the maximum amount of slip down here at the beginning, and it averages about 9 meters, because that's how much slip's accumulated there in the last 330 years since the last earthquake happened. As you go farther north, up here it's only been 150 years, but the fault moves a bit faster. In here, in the 18 of 12 area, uh, the fault moves slowly as well, and so it's got the smallest amount of slip. It's only about three meters. Right. We then have to say how that's going to be traveling through California. And uh, one of the important things that we need to do is to look at um, uh, the type of, of situation that it's going to be traveling through. And in addition to the faults, there's also a lot of basins. I'm going to... Um, and so let's... Those basins have a lot of impact on how the waves travel. We actually asked four modeling teams to come in here and do this work, taking their own, each was using a different code, each was using um, the same fault, the same earthquake model, but a different representation of what the ground would be like. And uh, what we found is a, a very high degree of similarity, and it gave us a lot of confidence that what we were seeing is really going to be affecting what goes on. And I can show you here, here are uh, samples from two of these different ones. You can see there are differences. Exactly where in LA do we see the high levels of shaking? That's the basin catching the waves. The, the idea of a, of a rock basin, you basically have a, bowl, you have a bowl of rock with sand inside. And it, it's awful, an awful lot like a glass bowl full of jello. And if you put a wave into that, if you hit a glass bowl of jello with a hammer, the glass would ping and you'll hear a little, you know, note for a second, but the jello will keep on slopping back and forth. And so the hard materials pass the waves through quickly. The soft material catches the waves and makes sets up a resonance. And the same thing goes on in the earth, and that's what you're seeing right here, uh, why we have these high pockets of shaking here. And you can compare it with the seismogram. So here would be a seismogram near the fault with a really large single motion, 
but then it dies off quickly. And here would be the type of seismogram we'd see in the basin where it's able to catch the shaking and keep on moving. Uh, if we add it all up, here's the total amount of damage we expect to see. So uh, the fault is 200 miles long, start, and we start down here at the southern end. That was also a choice. Uh, we think it's a likely, the most likely way for the fault to move because that's the end of the fault. And if, imagine if you were trying to rip a piece of paper. You'd start at one side and rip across. And that usually is about 80% of the time that's what we see in an earthquake. So we think that's the most likely place to start. It could, however, start here and rupture back the other direction. Because it starts here, we tend to focus energy into Los Angeles as the rupture moves up the fault, and we see a lot of damage here. If we'd started up here, Los Angeles would have gotten a lot less shaking, as would have Orange County, and Mexicali would have been creamed. We made the choice to not create an international incident with our scenario. Um, and also, we're trying to help Los Angeles and Southern California understand how to prepare, not, not Mexico in this situation. I mean, to, to give you a comparison, the, this right here is sort of, you could stop here and have gotten the really important points. Because let's compare this to Northridge. Here's the same type of map on the same scale. The fault in Northridge was about 10 miles across. Now, it dipped at an angle to the Earth's surface, so we had a lot of people literally on top of the fault. The San Andreas is a vertical fault, so very few people are directly on top of it, but you still get all of the shaking coming around. Compare the size of the area in red. That's where you have really extensive shaking. And here's where you see what's really different about these big earthquakes. Not that the worst shaking is that much worse than Northridge, but that so many more people are subjected to it. Uh, and that's a really big difference because we are going to be looking at how social systems respond to the event. And the more damage and the more people needing help, the more likely you are to reach a point at which you no longer have the resources to handle it. And that's what we're concerned about with this really big event. Uh, for another uh, uh, more recent comparison, there's the Chino Hills earthquake that happened a couple of months ago. You notice there's no red at all. Right? We did not have any area with strong shaking. And it's about the Chino Hills earthquake is one five thousandth the size of the earthquake we're expecting, uh, or as this mo earthquake that we're modeling here. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm going to show you another way of looking at it where we've actually made a movie of what the shaking is going to be like. Notice right here is our timer. This is in real time as we go through. And this, the colors here are showing how fast the ground is moving. The little spot of white right along the fault, the ground is moving at two meters per second. So that's, you know, six feet to, to go over six feet and back in a second. It's very fast motions and very large motions. You're seeing the rupture moving up the fault and then the waves traveling out. Uh, I didn't even get to that. Northridge was shown at the same scale in time and space. It's, oh, it was over everywhere in 25 seconds. This one is going to be going on, shaking somewhere for about four minutes. Right. The rupture front is traveling at two miles per second up the fault. The fault is 200 miles long. There's 100 seconds that the Earth is producing energy. We're, not quite, we're a little over halfway through that. Notice here, remember, look at what's happening in the Coachella Valley. I said the basins trap the energy. That's what you're seeing here. We're over a minute into the earthquake. It's been shaking. It's about 45 seconds of very strong shaking in the Coachella Valley. And then the same thing happens over here in the northern part of the Orange County, which is the Los Angeles Basin, San Gabriel Valley, Los Angeles Basin. And then you'll see it later coming along uh, in the Ventura Basin. Everywhere we have our bowls of jello, we're going to see trapped energy and shaking continue for longer times. So this is a fundamental. Northridge, the reason we keep on saying Northridge isn't a big earthquake, right? It was seven seconds long and about a half a million people living on top of it, right? This is, well, and we had about a million people that received very strong shaking in Northridge. We're going to have about 10 million people receiving very strong shaking in this event. We're now two minutes into it on this movie, and you can see how we've really got the trapped energy going on in the Los Angeles Basin, so northern Orange County and, and west L.A., and now we're getting it going in Oxnard as well. 
right. When this happens, damage is cumulative. The last second of your strong shaking is always the worst because things have continued to break. And the extra duration is going to lead to many other types of damage that we haven't seen in previous events. But even more is the fact of how many more people are going to be involved. I'm going to skip on out. Just know that it goes on for about another minute, but I'm going to pass on here. We actually went through and figured out what was the duration of strong shaking at various sites. Santa Monica has the longest duration that we saw anywhere on here. Orange County, it's about 35 seconds. That's for up around the Anaheim area. Now, there's another thing that goes on with the earthquake besides the shaking. Remember when I go back to my finger snapping analogy, the sound is the shaking. But there's also the movement of my fingers. And, you know, the same thing goes on in the earth. Here's an example from an earthquake that happened in 1855 in New Zealand. You can see there's a stream coming out of the mountains. And here's the rest of the stream. These two guys are standing in the same stream. And before the earthquake, they would have been able to shake hands. After the earthquake, they're about 55 feet apart. Now, this is the largest offset that we know about. I went to New Zealand to see this. But we estimate about 10 to 30 feet on the San Andreas. Remember where I had 3 meters to 9 meters as our assumed average slip? That's what this is. Now, start thinking about what happens to anything that crosses the fault. It's going to be cut apart just like the stream bed is, even if it's a road or a railway or a pipeline. Another piece that we did within this study is we estimated the secondary effects. One of them is this fault offset and mapping out in detail. An extraordinary guy, Jerry Tryman from the California Geological Survey, knows the San Andreas better than probably anybody alive at this point and has walked every strand of it. And he took our estimates of the average amount of slip and put them in a plausible distribution along every strand through the fault system. So this is just an example. Actually, at Cajon Pass, you can see Interstate 15, where it crosses the fault. He thinks that there's going to be four different places breaking anywhere from a half a meter to three and a half meters. The I-15 will not be passable after this event. And none of the pipelines along that area are going to be intact as well. We also looked at a question with something called liquefaction, which is a phenomenon that happens when you shake a loose sand. Imagine if you had a canister of flour and you shook it. Remember, it would settle. Well, the same thing, you take that bowl of loose sand, our sedimentary basins, you get the same phenomenon. You shake them and they settle. And they compact. And you'll often see subsidence and settlement that happens in an earthquake because of that. Now, if you also have groundwater in that sand, as the sand settles, the spaces where the water was distributed are disappearing. And in the time of the earthquake, those few seconds, the water can't just disappear. And it doesn't have time yet to flow away. So the water pressure goes up. Well, the definition of quicksand is a sand where the water pressure in the sand is equal to the weight of the sand. And what happens in liquefaction is loose sand with water in it temporarily becomes quicksand until that water can flow away from that area, which usually takes several minutes. Well, quicksand doesn't do a very good job of holding up buildings. And we see a lot of damage that happens in that situation. So as part of this study, a group from the U.S. Geological Survey compiled all the information we had about the distribution of soils in Southern California and got this liquefaction susceptibility map. This is actually the first time it's been put together at this scale. But they took another step then, because this is the traditional way to assess it. Where do we have the potential? Where are the sands there? And this picture would lead us to feel we could have a really bad time during this earthquake. Imagine if we had liquefaction distributed like this. All of the Los Angeles basin is potentially susceptible. And there would just be huge levels of damage if we had liquefaction over the whole area. But the reality is 150, 200 years of human habitation in Southern California have done a real number on our water table. 
and there's a lot less water distributed through our sands in the area. And John and Dan did this amazing study of coming up with what the distribution, likely depth to the water table was, based on analyzing thousands of wells and annual records about where the water would be. We specified that the earthquake would be in November, which gives us an even lower water table than we could at some times, but in many places the water table's down all year round. When we put that together, we come up with this as our distribution of liquefaction probability, and it becomes a much smaller problem than it looked like from the first distribution of susceptibility. And the only place that's really got an issue is the southern part of the Coachella Valley, where the water table is held up by the Salton Sea, and it's essentially at the surface of the ground, and in addition the sands are very susceptible sands in that region. So the southernmost part of the Coachella Valley, and then a little bit in the San Bernardino Inland Empire area, are the only places that we think are going to have a significant risk. Another phenomenon that we looked at is landslides. These really big earthquakes are famous for causing huge landslides. And part of the reason is you've got this really long fault producing energy with really long periods and really long wavelengths, strongly affecting the really big landslides. So the very largest earthquakes are notorious for the landslides that are caused. You might have heard about it with the Sichuan earthquake that happened in May. Major landslides up through those mountains, creating earthquake lakes and cutting off whole village roads and many villages and burying some villages. We estimate 10,000 to 100,000 landslides to be created by this event. Now most of them are distributed in the mountains, and in many parts those mountains don't have human habitation. So this isn't as bad as it could be, but there are some areas, especially along the I-5 corridor, that are of concern and along the edge of the Coachella Valley and up around Mount San Gregorio, although this is mostly a wilderness area where the worst of them are going to be occurring there. So that's a picture of the earth science. Let me go on now to the damages. We took an interesting process to get here. We took all of these earth science effects you've just seen and we gave them to 19 study groups, which involved with 19 different areas of the type of damage that we could be having. In some cases we would have a research team. In some cases we had a panel where, like the electric power, we brought in representatives of Edison and DWP, as well as consultants or, you know, consulting engineers that work on electrical systems. And so we took a variety of approaches. This is where we ended up getting so many people involved. And we asked each of the group to talk about what would be the realistic damages they would expect, in many cases being informed by computer models, but also then compared to the historic evidence that's available from previous earthquakes. And, you know, we acknowledge that we have to extrapolate because many times the past events really don't correlate with what we know to be the future, and we have to, you know, do the best that we could within this. And then the next step that we asked them to do would be to look at what could be done to reduce those losses. When we put this all together, let's look at what ends up coming out of this. Estimate that we have 300,000 buildings that will be damaged at least by 10 percent of the replacement value of the building. One in 16 buildings around Southern California would be significantly damaged. Infrastructure damages turned out to be a very large piece of it. The economic bottom line is over $200 billion in losses. I'll show you where that all comes from as we go through it. A very large number of people that will need to be displaced from their homes, a very large number of injuries, relatively speaking, not that many deaths compared to the other levels of losses. And this is a reflection of the commitment that California has made to what we call life safety building codes. Many people don't realize this, but our building code is not intended to guarantee that your building will not be damaged in an earthquake. Our building code philosophically says you choose how much money you want to invest in your building, and if you choose to build a weak building and it's a complete financial loss after the event, that was the way you chose to spend your money. But don't kill anybody in the process. So the building code is the minimum necessary to keep the building from killing people. It is not keeping the building from being damaged. 
And if it's a complete write-off, but no one was killed, it's considered a success. The problem is most people don't know they're making that decision. And when someone builds a building to sell it, which is the overwhelming majority of the time, if they build a stronger building, they aren't going to get the money back because the people who are buying the building don't have the information that this is stronger than what they could have done. And therefore, in almost every case, only the minimum is what is done, which is what's expressed in the building code. I will tell you that I work for the U.S. Geological Survey, but I have been on campus at Caltech for all of my career. And that makes me really glad. I would rather be in a Caltech building during an earthquake than just about anywhere else. The reason is Caltech builds to own. They build their own buildings and intend to keep on owning them. They understand the earthquake risks extremely well. They have their earthquake engineering department review every plan. And they don't want to waste their money having to rebuild it later. So they start, whenever they build a building, they start by saying, whatever the building code says, we're going to add 50 percent and then decide what else we want to add on. They consider investing up front to be a much better way to do it. But most of Southern California doesn't. And the result is what we see here. As we said, 300,000 significantly damaged. Of that, about 1 percent, 45,000 will be a complete loss, will have to just be torn down and replaced. The most dangerous type of building is what is called unreinforced masonry, a brick wall that holds up your roof. The engineers call them URMs. The seismologists often call them FPRs or future piles of rubble. We are saying, and basically all URMs in Southern California will be a loss after this event. Many of them have been retrofitted. Los Angeles led the way to requiring retrofitting of URMs. All 10,000 in Los Angeles were either torn down or retrofitted. About 3,000 were torn down and 7,000 were retrofitted. Most of those will probably be a financial write-off, will probably not be repairable, but they shouldn't be coming down. The main thing of the retrofitting is to keep the roof from collapsing on people. Unfortunately, not all communities have been that proactive. San Bernardino has a couple of hundred URMs right by the San Andreas that have not been retrofitted. The almost as dangerous are types of older concrete buildings that the engineers call non-ductile reinforced concrete moment frame buildings, which I think is an attempt to get people to not understand what they're talking about. Non-ductile, as far as I can tell, is the same thing as brittle, but people think it sounds bad to say you've got a brittle building. These are the class of buildings, the concrete buildings built in the 50s and 60s. One of them was the Olive View Hospital that collapsed in 1971. And because of that, that type of building is outlawed from the building code, and it's not been built since then. The problem, of course, is that no building code in the world is retroactive. Your building is as good as the building code that was in place when it was built and to the degree that it was followed. And so how much of Southern California was built in the 50s and 60s in concrete buildings? Much of our commercial environment falls within this category. And many of them, in fact, the majority of them are just fine. But there is a subset of them, about 10 percent of this type of building, have a very serious defect in how the building is hooked together. And they are very dangerous in earthquakes. And when they collapse, they tend to kill a lot of people. And we are estimating 100 of them will be a complete loss, and 50 will actually be collapsed. Wood frame buildings are by far the most numerous buildings in Southern California, and they are also the safest. Wood is very flexible in earthquakes. We think only 1 in 25 will actually be suffering any sort of damage, and very few of them will lead to any deaths. Because when they tend to collapse, like this one in the middle picture here, and you can see it's damaged, it slips off its foundation, that's often a very significant problem. They're either not bolted to the foundation, or they don't have a cripple wall, or the cripple wall is not reinforced. That's the small wall that forms the edge of a crawl space between the foundation and the first floor. And it used to be you just did that with 2x4s. And 2x4s standing up like this make really good dominoes and go right over in an earthquake. And reinforcing them is simply a matter of nailing plywood 
to those two by fours and can be the difference a complete loss of the building to being completely fine and it costs less than a thousand dollars per building that's the probably the the most cost-effective mitigation retrofitting measure that could be undertaken steel frame buildings these are things that make our high-rises and generally they are a lot safer than the other types of buildings however we discovered in 1994 that there were cracks that formed in the welds of some of these buildings and the theory of why a steel frame building is a safe place to be in an earthquake is that steel bends rather than breaking and so even if you exceed the strength of the building it would bend it won't collapse unfortunately what we discovered in 94 is that the process that was used to to weld the the beams together during construction in some cases changed the chemical properties of the steel and it became brittle it was able to crack and then when the cracks formed in the welds they then propagated in some instances into the the other beams because of this problem it's it's a it's a well-known thing but it's a it's a very difficult problem it could be widespread we don't we can't even really know it costs a lot of money to even get in and look at the weld of a steel frame building it's all covered in in architectural finishing on these buildings it has led to collapse this is a picture of a similar building in Japan in 1995 and when we engaged a team from Caltech to to do the modeling and actually take these waves that we've created and put them through through numerical models of the buildings and their conclusion is that the collapse of the collapse of pre-94 steel moment frame buildings is a credible scenario and this has been reviewed by the structural engineering community it's seen as being realistic they are less dangerous in general than all the other types but they are not immune you know so I went through and did that all right there excuse me so given all of that building damage what do we think is going to be happening one thing is that they're going to be a lot of people that will be displaced from their homes we estimate we're going to need more than 500 public shelters the good news here is that because of the field act California's public schools are extraordinarily safe buildings the field act has mandated that whenever a public school is built there will be continuous inspection there will be an inspector on site at all times going wait a minute the plans say four feet you've only dug three keep on digging wait a minute you need twelve nails there you've only put in ten two more nails and every step is watched and because of that the public schools are a much safer place to be the unfortunately UC's are not covered by the field act neither are Cal State's but the community colleges are because this came out of the 1933 earthquake and damage to elementary schools and just the horror at the idea of all those children that would have died and you can see how what good it does by looking at the Northridge earthquake in that area of highest shaking there were two community colleges field act buildings and and Cal State Northridge in the areas of highest shaking Pierce College which was older buildings had five million dollars in structural damage Mission College which are all new buildings had no structural damage Cal State Northridge which was a mix of old and new buildings had four hundred and five million dollars worth of damage that's what the field act gets you and the big there's two aspects one is the continuous inspection the other one is plan check the designs have to be approved by structural engineers at all stages so the one good news is we're going to have plenty of places to set up public shelters remember I said that the fault's going to be offset and there's a lot of things crossing the fault this is going to cause a lot of disruption to our normal what we would consider normal life lots of things have to come into Southern California for us to live here we have passed the point at which we can Southern California can sustain its population we need to bring in water we need to bring in food we need to bring in all of our telecommunications we bring in our natural gas and we send out gasoline all of Nevada's gasoline supply comes from Los Angeles by pipes that cross the San Andreas Fault when this happens we think that the phone service is going to be out that's actually 
shouldn't have put this on the top one, because this one isn't so much the crossing the fault, though it is an issue. The major Internet, two-thirds of our Internet bandwidth connectivity to the rest of the world goes out through fiber optic cables across the San Andreas, one through Cajon Pass and one through San Gregorio Pass. Uh, but also cell phone towers are not regulated. So there's no regulation saying they have to be secured against seismic shaking. And we think that we will be losing a percentage of the cell phone towers. So the phone company, the phone system will continue to operate. Your chances of accessing it are going to be pretty low. Um, electricity and gas outages are also going to be very widespread. Um, now, when we, you know, completed the analysis, we got both the electric and gas companies were really certain of their ability to get service restored within the first week. Uh, actually, as we've continued to discuss this, this is getting reevaluated. This might end up growing a bit as we do a – we're in a public comment period on this scenario right now and the opportunity to give feedback and, and starting to – there's a place where some more issues have come up. Water system actually becomes one of the worst of them. Now, all of our water – you know, we have a small amount of, of groundwater that's used in, the, in Southern California – the overwhelming majority of our water comes through three big systems, all of which cross the San Andreas within the area which it's going to break here. Because of this, the Metropolitan Water District has stored – has its main storage reservoirs on this side of the San Andreas. It's been an actively considered aspect of it. However, the water has to get from those reservoirs to your homes, and that happens through pipes like these that have broken in earthquakes over and over and over and over again. However, in general, our water systems are some of the oldest things we have. They're the first thing you put in when you build, build a community. And uh, we know that that risk is there, and we haven't come up with the resources to change them all out, for instance. And um, the very scary model that came through this panel discussion with the water conveyance people is it may take up to six months to get water back into all areas. One of the reasons is in places that are hard hit, uh, the way you fix it is you find, you know, you find the first leak that coming out of the reservoir. So you, you dig it up, you fix the leak, you rebury the pipe, you repressurize it to find the second leak, to dig it up, repressure, you know, fix it, repressurize it, find the third leak. If there's too many leaks, it just doesn't make sense, and the only way to do it is to relay the system. And so there's quite a few communities that are just going to have to create a new water system. In addition, in a lot of communities you've got the sewers running next to the water pipes, and they're going to be breaking, too. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think I want them to lay a new water system in those instances. Um, but it's also, imagine what life is going to be like when you can't flush the toilet. All right. Um, transportation. <laughs> now you want to get out of here. That's going to be tough, too. Um, the repairs are going to cause months of delays. Uh, we don't think we're going to have the type of free highway bridge collapses that we saw in the Loma Prieta earthquake. Since the Loma Prieta earthquake, Caltrans has spent $6 billion retrofitting our bridges. It's been an amazing effort, and we think it's going to work. However, it doesn't apply to local jurisdictions' bridges. Something, if it belongs to the city of Irvine or Orange County, they didn't fall under that um, retrofitting program. And in addition, there's other ways that we can shut down the roads, and one of them is for the first three days without power, we aren't going to have traffic lights. Uh, and then you're going to have debris in the roads, and it's going to be very difficult to, to get anywhere. All right. uh, it's also a factor for commuters. Uh, the roads are going to be disrupted in a lot of places, but in addition, we've discovered there are 250,000 people that live on the opposite side of the San Andreas from where they work. If it happens during work hours, they aren't getting home. There are 900 roads crossing the San Andreas, but every one of them is going to be offset by 10 to 30 feet. Uh, so it becomes a, a very big issue uh, for disruption of the commuters. We also think that it's going to last for a while. There was a model that was done to try and estimate how long it would take to get the various roads repaired. Uh, this was done in conjunction with Caltrans to try and understand this. And as you can see, um, there's widespread disruption. Most freeways will not be passable within the first three days. And even up to five months later, we are still going to be having uh, a noticeable impact, especially along the San Andreas. Uh, dams are another susceptible problem. Uh, we do think that there are going to be – there are 30 dams that are going to receive strong enough shaking to be an issue. 
The one thing is many of them don't have a lot of water in storage, and it's going to need to have a combination of enough damage and water to cause a problem, but we're actually estimating something like three dams might be in bad enough shape that they're going to evacuate below it. Now you're ready for the real problem. Fire. We can understand how fires happen after earthquakes. There's a lot of ignitions that happen, and there's actually been studies of how they've taken place, and we can give you the rate, number of ignitions per thousand households at a certain shaking area. And we've done that for this earthquake, extrapolating from the previous smaller events. But in addition, at the same time, a lot of the fire protection features that are in our house are degraded by the shaking damage. You know, you've broken it open, you exposed the wood to the air and increased the fire risk that way. I just told you we were losing a lot of our water supply. Our communications isn't going to work to be deploying the fire engines. They aren't going to be able to get through the traffic jams. And what you add that all up, and you come to the conclusion that there are going to be conflagrations. There are going to be fires that get out of control. Now, the two largest we've ever seen in peacetime were also earthquakes, 1906 in San Francisco and 1923 in Tokyo. When we put it all together, we ended up estimating 1,600 ignitions requiring a fire engine. And of those, 1,200 would then grow to exceed the capacity of the first engine. And the problem is we don't have that many fire engines in Southern California. So the fires get out of control in some areas. An estimate of up to 200 million square feet of property being burnt. And the total losses actually exceed the shaking losses. The other point is we assumed, we explicitly said there would not be Santa Ana winds. Unfortunately, we can't do that with the real one. And so this is not the worst case scenario. The end result is that it doubles both the casualties and the financial losses. Now, in response to this, the California Seismic Safety Commission is bringing together a special panel to try and look for ways and steps that we could take beforehand that could be reducing some of these risks. And a lot of things are being considered. The L.A. County Fire Department, actually, I guess all of the fire departments in the region have come together and are looking this over because of this result. And so this might lead to some really positive changes that we can hope come through. This is another scarier one. We're going to need a lot of extra hospitals, and it says 20,000. And we did say 50,000 would need emergency room visits. But it's going to be happening at a time when some of our hospitals may look like this, and many others may be closed not because of structural damage, but because water pipes have broken and flooded the emergency rooms. You can't operate a hospital if you've been contaminated with broken water lines or broken sewer lines. It's going to be very hard to keep the capacity, and we're going to need it. So a major issue is going to be medical evacuations. The cool, this is horrid, the cool part has been that because of this, Ventura County, as part of the big exercise in November, is going to be exercising how to receive medical evacuations out of Los Angeles, San Bernardino, and Riverside counties. And so the medical community is really engaging with this finding and has started working on it. In general, this is going to be a major problem of how we respond to the emergency, because one of the fundamental approaches that we take for responding to big disasters is the system of mutual aid. We've organized the state where the counties cooperate with each other. When Northridge happened, San Bernardino sent all its fire trucks out to help Los Angeles out. And the mutual aid system makes sure that they'll be repaid for the expenses that they incur. And it's become a fundamental of how we manage this risk. The problem is, San Bernardino is going to be in worse shape than us. We're going to need our mutual aid help to be coming from San Francisco, Arizona, and Nevada. And they're going to have to get here through all those transportation problems that I was just telling you about. And that's going to be really a major issue, how we're going to be able to get the mutual aid in. And so this becomes another fundamental. This is why you're being told, be on your own for three days. It's not because they can't, it's that, you know, the emergency responders aren't going to be here or aren't going to be doing their job. They're going to be killing themselves, doing way more than any human being should do. And there still just won't be enough of them. And that's where we're going to need to learn to handle things ourselves, because this is just going to be 
more than we have the capacity for around here. I want to end this with a little discussion about the economic impacts of this. Because this is one of the things we're looking at is, are we going to be a disaster or are we going to be a catastrophe? And uh, let me show you what we think is the difference of it. If you take an economic activity or, or the, you know, the, the wealth, what's, what are our financial resources in a region versus time, we expect it to grow. We have economic growth going on in most times. Um, if we have an earthquake, we lose a lot of that. We lose uh, um, assets are destroyed, but also businesses are shut down. There's no water, there's no power, there's no transportation. Nobody's creating new, new products at this point. But right after the earthquake, some of the utilities come back on, and then people start repairing things, and they, start, they get insurance payments, and they um, you know, hire contractors who hire subcontractors, and you get a pattern more like this that comes through where they jumps back up, and we, and we get back up, and within a matter of a few years, we're back to where we were before. Right? But it doesn't have to happen like this. If you look at the type of thing that happened with Katrina, it looked more like this, where it starts to recover, but there were just so many things destroyed, and there were so many people who weren't there anymore, and businesses tried to reopen, but their customers were gone, or the customers were trying to come back, and the businesses weren't there, and, you know, the... Nurses needed a place to go grocery shopping, and without a hospital, somebody couldn't come back because they needed care for their parent, etc. The system came apart, and, uh, and it faltered, and you go into long-term depression. And the difference between these two is really in the, not in the immediate uh, damage at the time of the event, but in what's the damage to the economy overall. So this is one of the things we tried to understand. How would this play out in California? And we looked at a wide variety of the types of damages and how they would affect the different types of economic losses and how it would – this is an economic model that was put together with Adam Rose at USC and uh, came up – that's where a lot of our costs come through. And the dominating feature – well, of course, the damage to structures and contents is a little over $100 billion, with fire being more than half of it. And when you looked at the business interruption, it's actually the water is the biggest shock because of it being out for such a long time. When your business is closed for a week, you get most of your customers back when you reopen. If you're out of business for six months, you're probably out of business forever. And so the financial losses grow substantially because of the time it takes. And that becomes, became one of the major conclusions is how quickly we could get our utilities back up and those services are going to be the critical factor in the economic health and our ability to recover from this. And this is of import to the whole country because if you look at what goes on in California and how we affect the nation, what goes on in Southern California is a very substantial part of what goes on in the nation. And just one issue for us, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, we don't think they'll be damaged in this particular earthquake, but their connection to the rest of the country will be because these roads have to go out across the San Andreas Fault. And just the two weeks of disruption that we're estimating here uh, leads to very large long-term economic impacts. And, in fact, when we uh, looked at this, just looking around the country, where do jobs depend on activity from the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach? Uh, we discover that it's a, it's, a, it's a national impact, and this is going to be going on for a long ways. The uh, you may not have looked at this question in the same way I did. I looked at this and go, why isn't it worse? This doesn't seem that bad, right? <laughs> this is a really big earthquake with a lot of people. And, and go look at what happened in Sichuan. You're talking about a much larger level of disruption to a large economy than what we're likely to have here. And there are several reasons. One of them is that we do have decent building codes, and they have made a difference. A second one is that mitigation works, and the state of California has undertaken a, a very high level of, of mitigation, especially with the bridges. A lot has been done by the power utilities, and we could do a lot more. There's also been good planning and legislation. I talked to you both about the FIELD Act and the URM laws have made a real difference over, uh, over the long run. There's also the fact that we have a very robust regional economy, and in spite of $200 billion seeming like a huge number, it's actually only 6% of the annual output of this area. And, and therefore, we have a big economy from which to be able to, to you know, help regrow what we want to do. And, of course, the other part is this wasn't the worst-case scenario. We really tried to – we tried not to, but it could be worse than this. So our bottom line – 
really gets down to it is that what we do now before the earthquake is going to determine what our lives are like afterwards. And notice that I say we, because you can make an individual choice. And if you make a choice to have a fire extinguisher, if you make a choice to store more water, you're going to have a better life after these events. And there's some pretty simple things like that can be done. If you choose to make get your built your house inspected and see whether or not it can be its foundation could be strengthened, you're going to be even in better shape, right? But if your neighbor hasn't done that, and your neighbor's house is damaged, and, and he, wa he doesn't have insurance, and so he walks away from the building, and you have an abandoned, damaged building next to you, think of what's happening to your property values. You know, this is something that we're all in this together, and it's going to be the decisions we make as individuals, but also the decisions we make as a group that are going to be making the difference. Which is why we have gone for the Southern California, the great Southern California shakeout. And we want to uh, have people take part in this, we want to also hear, oh, Lord, I have the wrong picture there. I, we want to also hear what you're going to be doing it. If you go to shakeout.org, that is a website where you can register your, part, your participation. And we are trying to get all possible organizations to take part. We are not telling them what to do. We've got examples. We, our website will give you a lot of ideas that you could undertake. But what we're trying to do is get people to think about what the earthquake means for them and then practice something that will actually make a difference for them. And then join us in doing this. We are already clearly going to be the largest earthquake drill that's ever happened in the United States. Uh, we are at 3.5 million people, which is about the largest drill that's ever happened in the world. There was one in Mexico City that was 3 million people. Uh, we want to go for quite a bit larger than this and be the largest earthquake drill ever because we're all in this together. Thank you.